Welcome to the Freedom Line, the podcast for the Center for Individual Freedom, where we meet nonsense with common sense. Here's your host, Renee Giacchino. Thank you for tuning into the Freedom Cast. My name is Renee Giacchino. I'm Corporate Counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom. Joining me again, and it has been far too long since I've introduced my friend back to the program, but here he is with us now, Andrew Oak. He is the first ladies' man, and he has authored several books. He's worked on some pretty incredible documentaries, and he's got lots of exciting projects coming up. But um, he really focuses on our uh, First Ladies, obviously, from the title. And you can follow him at firstladiesman.com. That's also where you can go to purchase his volumes one and two, Unusual for Their Time. I own both of them and given them as gifts to pretty much uh, all the important women in my life. Welcome back to the program, Andrew. It's a pleasure to have you with me. Renee, always a pleasure. Yes, wonderful to be back with you. So you have been a very busy First Ladies man. Uh, <laughs> fill us in on some of the exciting things that you've been doing, and then let's talk about some of the exciting things that are coming up. And then we'll we'll address, you know, I think it's a perfect time, as always, to have you on the program, but specifically in March, Women's History Month, and then we'll talk about some of our first ladies and the impressions that they have left and why it is important to talk about them this month, if not every month. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the first ladies man is celebrating uh, women's history uh, every day, every month. And it's thanks to, to good folks like you that have me on that I've made all these connections and spread my word in kind of a, a grassroots kind of way. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the first ladies man and there's not a whole team of first ladies men or women working behind me and we put the word out and do these interviews and and because of that I was found by a gentleman named Reverend Nicholas Inman in Marshfield, Missouri and he's been running a very successful, wildly successful cherry blossom festival for the past, I don't know, 14, 15, maybe 16 years. And he focuses on first ladies, among other things, during that first lady or during that cherry blossom festival. He had me out, gave me an, an award for my literary work, and introduced me to a bunch of people. Ten different, at least ten different presidential first lady administrations were represented in families, ancestors, direct relatives, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren. The, the works. It was just absolutely amazing. And through that is how I met a large number of folks in the Carter family. I met Rosalind Carter's uh, sister, Alethea, and her daughter and and, uh, their their other uh, niece, a cousin, Leanne Smith, who do a lot of work down in Plains, Georgia. So I was invited down to the first annual Butterfly Days in Plains, Georgia, where I was able to meet and speak with President Carter and First Lady Rosalind Carter and give Mrs. Carter a set of my books for her 95th birthday, while we were dedicating a beautiful, beautiful butterfly statue in the newly opened and dedicated Rosalind Carter Childhood Garden, where school children and groups can come and learn about conservation and butterflies and the world around them. And it's in the side yard next to the home that Rosalind Carter was born and raised in there in Plains, Georgia. So it's just been an absolutely fantastic couple of years, I guess, you know, or, or months or, or, or getting back out there after COVID. So you're right. I'm a, I'm a very, very busy first ladies man. Some very exciting things. Um, I know that um, you've got something coming up in 2024. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because, you know, for folks who, who you know, visit the website, firstladiesman.com, you do have a tab, your speaking tour, and it is a yep. full full schedule. I mean, everywhere from Annapolis, you know, in in Maryland, as you mentioned, back to Missouri, you are headed. Um, Some speaking engagements around, you know, Washington, D.C., back down in Georgia. And then looking ahead to just over a year from now, tell us about the First Lady's Man of the Sea and what you have going (laughs) on there. And is there still space available? And how can folks... um, come along sure sure my god this is just like a big giant promo which i greatly appreciate and i know we'll get to the ladies which are the important thing but all of these events and like you said the one at the one in annapolis was fantastic they're all great they're all fun they're all neat but annapolis is basically my backyard and that's and that was at the naval academy speaking to uh teachers and members of the military there at the naval academy which was actually a, a fantastic evening 
Um, and, and all around, like you say, back down to uh, uh, August in, in August for the second annual Butterfly Days, back to Missouri uh, for the Cherry Blossom Festival, which also we'll get into. We are, I, am on a, a, I am on the board of directors for a National First Ladies' Day Commission. We are going to petition Congress, I'm sure successfully, I don't see why they would say no, to get a First Ladies' Day on the national calendar like we have a President's Day in February. First Ladies' Day will be the last Saturday in April, which coincides with the Cherry Blossom Festival in Missouri. It also coincides with when Martha Washington became our first First Lady towards the end of April, when that first Washington inauguration was in the 1790s, <clears throat> 1780s rather. And and uh, that's going to be a national day of service and, and doing things for your community and education, all the great things that First Ladies do. But something that's been on my idea board, my dry erase board for a long time, is a First Ladies Van Cruise. And that's April 1st through April 6th of 2024. And if you go to my website, firstladiesman.com, it's top on the page. You click on that. It takes you to the cruise directors. There's plenty of room. The more, the merrier. We're going to do a state dinner. We're going to do speeches while we're at sea, a private tour of the, uh, of the, of the summer White House of President Truman down in Key West. And we're going to the Bahamas. Um, it, it going out dancing on the ship and just I, I'm a go 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 kind of guy and once you get your first ladies man of the sea lanyard you'll be able to go 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 wherever I go and whatever I do on the ship in addition to those special events and a signed book and photo op and meet and greet and all this stuff but um, I like I say I, I have, I've got a ton of friends that are musicians that do these you know 80s cruises and and um, you know hair metal cruises and country cruises and all these different things and I thought well why not you know why people people want to hear about history just like they want to hear music and go on these cruises and these theme cruises are a big deal and in between me thinking of it and trying to figure out how to do it a cruise director who saw my posts and me online or heard interviews or whatever a lovely woman named Beth and her husband Rod run this cruise director business out of Maryland contacted me and said would you be interested in a cruise I said not only would I be interested I've got it right next to my First Ladies Man costume contest and, you know, mm -hmm. First Ladies Halloween contest and First Ladies Man uh, college course and all the other things that I've got running around in my head. So we, we're putting it together for April. Plenty of room, and you can register right on FirstLadiesMan.com. And that is for April 2024, so people have plenty of time to plan. And, you know, I, I, I meet with a lot of um, – rising high school or rising college students and they talk about oh my goodness I want to do this semester at sea where you travel around and you study during the day and then you visit these ports and it's like this is not a semester but boy you might even get some folks who want to do a semester but certainly a, a week at sea with a history lesson but also you know you've certainly talked about peppering in a lot of different fun things from yeah. you know visiting the, the the summer presidential white house in Key West to your state dinner your speeches your signed books your photo ops you're just running around the Bahamas together um but I, I think it's important, you know, I mean, we, we all want to be lifelong learners. And when we have these opportunities, you know, I always say, seize the opportunity. So April 1st through April 6th, the First Lady's Man of the Sea Ocean Cruise. You picked a good cruise line, Celebrity Cruises, can't go wrong there. It's a five-night cruise to the Bahamas with stops in Miami and lots of other places. Again, I know we don't intend this to be, you know, a promo on the First Lady's Man, but I think what you're doing is exciting. I think that, you know, consistently talking about and learning history and the importance of women in history, and particularly some of the most influential women in history, um, it behooves all of us, uh, you know, to make sure that, that we understand, you know, the role that the First Ladies, you know, play and have played in history. And that being said, let's talk, if we can, a little bit about um, some of the most influential women in history who have served as our first ladies. Now, I'm going to list a few that I think most folks who follow history, have studied history, are pretty familiar with. You've got your Abigail Adams, your Edith Roosevelt, your Eleanor Roosevelt, Jackie Kennedy, uh, Rosalind Carter, as you mentioned, Nancy Reagan, Hillary Clinton. I want to focus first on a couple of them 
And maybe it's because their husbands weren't that popular, but certainly when we go back and, you know, reading, you know, volume one and volume two of Unusual for Their Time, they stand out a little more even, you know, than some of the others. But if we could start with Sarah Polk, you know, I think that a lot of folks aren't familiar with really the wonderful role that she played in, in her husband's presidency. Well, you're right, Renee, and and those are the ones that I often speak about, the the, the kind of below the fold and the ones that we don't know, because we know what we know about the ones, and not that there's not more things to talk about and more things to discover with them, but if we start at ground zero with a lot of people don't even know that James K. Polk's wife's name was Sarah. You know, we're introducing these people for the first time to a greater audience. And Sarah Polk, they they didn't have children, uh, Sarah and James K. Polk, for whatever reason. And that left her free to do other things that other first ladies were not able to do because she wasn't raising a family. In for for first instance, she did not stay home in Tennessee when Polk went to be a congressman in Washington, D.C. She went with him and he became Speaker of the House. And when he was Speaker of the House, he would entertain other congressmen, both sides of the aisle, all types. They had bipartisan poker games and 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 uh, dinners at the house. And she would walk around and listen and listen. And one of the first things she discovered being in Washington, D.C. with all these political men was that they drank a lot. And when they drank a lot, they started talking about stuff that they probably shouldn't have talked about. Loose lips sink ships or let a few cats out of the bag that probably should have stayed in the bag. And she pulled her husband aside very early in his political career and said, okay, we're not doing that. You're not doing that. We gain to, we stand to gain so much more by sitting back and sipping wine as opposed to drinking rum punches or, or, or heavy drinking of, of any kind of kind of liquor and things that were popular in the day. Lots of whiskey and rum and, and things like that. If you just sit back or, or drink coffee or tea or you, you know, what, whatever have you and, and not getting, getting, uh, 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 a little liquored up then you can just take all the information that people are giving you. And she brought that into the White House. And she had massive, massive 16-course dinners that would start at 2 in the afternoon and go all through. So this extensive kind of formal dinner and politicking where it wasn't as much of a party as some of the other administrations had been or would be in the future. It was a social gathering. People did dress up. It was formal. There were great foods and great dishes and, like I say, multiple courses. But there was a lot more business conducted. She was also his kind of uh, uh, campaign manager before there were the official titles of campaign managers, and certainly women of the day were not doing it. A few first ladies do this throughout time, and then as we as we move on, first ladies become a much better, a much bigger role in their husbands' campaigns and political careers. But back when Polk was running, it was unheard of, and she was very, very well read and a, and a political mastermind, and she would know where Polk's opponents were going and what topics they were speaking on, and she could get him ahead of the game and get there either right before his opponent or right after his opponent to kind of counterbalance that viewpoint, and and much of that worked and got him elected. So very, very influential in a behind-the-scenes and more quiet kind of way, but, but very importantly, in a time when women just were not doing that. Do, do I recall correctly that she also helped write some of his speeches? Oh, certainly. And I think there's a lot. That, I think, is a, I think that goes on more than we know or went on more than we know and continues to be. I mean, let's think about it. You know, I, I do this with my significant other. I come home. I write an article. I have her. Well, she's got a master's in English, and I do not, so that's helpful <laughs> as well. And I'm a horrible speller. But, but beyond that, I can tell a pretty good story, and I get a good, I get a good version down on on paper, so to speak. But but any of my articles, a lot of my posts and stuff are like, hey, just put a second set of eyes on this. And if you think mm-hmm. where these men are writing these speeches, these great speeches, and when they're writing them, and, and the opportunities to bounce it off. I mean, they didn't have email. They didn't have, you know, phones or, or God knows, cell phones to call people up and say, hey, let me run things by. Well, who's right there? Their wife. Hey, honey, read this and, and, and tell me what you think. And so, so of course, Sarah Polk in in a, in in more of a way than than some or most maybe and and definitely more of a strategic mind uh, than than some or most but but I think in the grand scheme of things and many of those women that you mentioned right off the top Hillary Clinton Nancy Reagan uh, 
Abigail Adams, I mean, the, the list goes on there, Edith Wilson certainly would have been looking over their husband's shoulders and, and, uh, and, and helping out on that front. In fact, there's a picture, you can Google this, Google, Elizabeth, or Google Edith Wilson and Woodrow Wilson, and he's sitting at his desk writing, and she's physically looking over his shoulder, and they would do that in the White House and, and beyond on a nightly basis. They had a, they had a tray, they had a little like portable uh, 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 file, file cabinet kind of thing that they would bring up to the residence each night, and Woodrow Wilson... And Edith Wilson would go over the news and the work and the documents of the day. So, so certainly Sarah Polk, yes, that's a great point. But I think that happened in, in, in much larger numbers than, than we even know and give credit to today. Andrew, you were looking at my notes because Edith Wilson uh, was the next one I was going to talk about. The fact that, you know, as you mentioned with Sarah Polk, who sat in on some of these dinners, that Edith Wilson would, in fact, uh, sit in on the meetings, you know, as you mentioned. Our guest is Andrew Oak. He's the first ladies' man. He is an author of Volumes 1 and 2 of Unusual for Their Time. Uh, he writes about and has heavily, heavily researched all of our all of America's first ladies. Um, let's talk a little bit um, in our Women's History Month about the youngest first lady. I mean, this young woman, I mean, at 21, I mean, who knows what they want to do with their life, let alone be the first wedding in the White House and then at the age of 21 to ascend to, you know, the first lady, uh, Frances Cleveland. Tell us about, you know, w- what you learned about her. Sure. And, and her, her influence, I mean, you know, we, ha- we have to think in terms, and this is, this is probably the hardest and nearly impossible thing to do as a historian, as a documentor of the past, uh, and when we go back into the 1800s and, and gosh knows, even further back, even into the, the early 1900s and, and middle 1900s, you know, you have to put yourself in that place. And it's impossible because you didn't live there. And we're just interpreting letters, interpreting pictures, interpreting stories, artifacts, all the other stuff. But you really can't get inside the mind of someone. So when a 49-year-old bachelor president, Grover Cleveland, marries a 21-year-old woman, uh, you know, that today would not fly. And and even back then, I think it was more that, that, that folks thought he was dating possibly uh, Francis Cleveland's mother. And the funny story behind this is Grover Cleveland was a law partner of, of a Mr. Folsom. And Francis Folsom, that's her father. So hmm. they were close friends. They were political partners. And, and Folsom, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, nearly on his deathbed or something of that sort, said to, to uh, his friend and partner, Grover Cleveland, like, hey, take care of my family. Watch out. You know, look over their money because women couldn't have bank accounts. Women couldn't have mortgages, education, barely, uh, mostly in the home and didn't have jobs and, and other things like that. So you had to put someone in charge of, of that estate or those funds and things. And, and it would turn out later on that, that President Grover Cleveland at 49 years old married a woman that now woman at 21 that he knew from birth. And he was basically <clears throat> referred to in the family as Uncle Cleve. He even gifted the family a, a, a baby carriage for what would be his future wife. But when you get to 21 and, and, and Francis had, had was, was, uh, I mean, you know, when people are dying in their early 20s, often because of diseases that are or, or ailments that are easily curable today, life was a different story. But but still, people kind of you know turned and turned an eyebrow up at at this whole thing. But she became basically Jacqueline Kennedy before Jacqueline Kennedy. She had the three things that are, that make any successful first lady. She's young, she's attractive, and she's smart. She's really smart. She's formally educated in New Jersey. And she becomes the image and co-image of campaigns. She helps uh, uh, humanize, as, as first ladies always do, maybe someone who might appear gruff and all business. Um, and, and so she did a great service to her husband. She also, they started having children in the White House. So that's even the fourth element to the trifecta that really pushes it over the edge because the, the, the country and, the, and the, the general population go crazy for kids in the White House. I mean, we want to see these families. We want to see these active families. We want to see young, vibrant families. We want to see this type of activity that we can aspire to or we can associate with having young families of our own. So young, attractive, new mother, 
and intelligent and can can and fashionable. You know, there's there's just stuff like that goes along even more so back in the in the 1800s than than today. Even though fashion trends still go on and we still talk about it as shallow as it might seem sometimes, but it is a role of image. It is a role of putting our first our best foot forward and how we represent ourselves to the world, how we entertain, which is also politicking. What kind of China? What type of events we have going around? I mean, look at Dr. Jill Biden, one of the most active first ladies we've had in 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 ever you know she's 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 seems like she's in two places at once and she does an extensive amount of traveling she, she's wildly popular as she goes on these events and and represents the united states with all kinds of humanitarian efforts and education efforts and francis cleveland was allowed and able to start this as a young popular celebrity of the day in her time we are talking with Andrew Oak. Andrew Oak is the first ladies man. We're celebrating Women's History Month with a discussion of some of America's first ladies. And we're talking about the first ladies that are featured in his books. Volume one is unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies. And then, and that covers, um, our first round of first ladies. We've got Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. And then volume two, the 1900s to 2016, Edith Roosevelt through Melania Trump which means volume three might be in the works? <laughs> well, it's always in the works. And, 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 and that's the great thing about this project and this subject matter. And a lot of people say, well, what's, what's your next topic? What's your name? Oh, there's, this is it, man. It's first ladies. First ladies all the time. I love it. I love being the first ladies, man. I love talking about them. They made me, you know, the first ladies, man. I didn't go to school to study this. Not a historian, radio, television, and film major from University of Maryland. Documentarian. And as a producer, you learn a lot about a lot of different subjects. But never did a subject matter grab me like the first ladies and make me realize not only how important they were and all the great work they did to make America what it is today and continue to do, but that we just don't know about it. We're not, we're not, mm-hmm. we're not widely taught about it and not widely heard. Like I mentioned, you know, Sarah Polk. A lot of people just found out today that, that President Polk had a wife named Sarah. And that's okay. A lot of people even just found out that President Wilson had a wife named Edith. He had a wife named Ellen before that. And Ellen Wilson is the reason we have a rose garden. So every time you turn on the TV and there's an event in the Rose Garden in modern times, you have Ellen Wilson, a woman that you most likely have never heard of in your life, but you see what she's done for us, for the American people, in representing to the world again. There's a place now at the White House where we can have formal outdoor events that is presentable and majestic and, and, and regal, for, for lack of a better term, but, but, but a nice place where we can do that at the White House because Ellen Wilson thought it was important to have a nice garden there because she had a nice garden up in uh, New Jersey when she was um, technically, I guess, the, the first lady of Princeton when Woodrow Wilson was president of Princeton in New Jersey. But it's a lovely garden. And so what she did was she took the White House gardener up on a train to Princeton and said, here's my garden at the Prospect House in Princeton. Make one at the White House because I think we need mm-hmm. something nice to look out the window and represent. And now that's where we have so many official ceremonies from, I mean, she would have put that in in, in 19, you know, 12 ish uh, before she died of, of Bright's disease, a kidney disease. And then Wilson, about a year later, marries Edith Wilson, who goes on to do her great things. But all of these women that we couldn't name if, if we were naming 5, 10, 15, 20 first ladies, 30 first ladies even some, in some cases. And they all had something to do with what we enjoy today as America or the White House or pop culture or education or information, communication, and uh, uh, entertaining at the White House. Speaking of entertaining at the White House, let's talk about um, Caroline Harrison, another name a lot of folks you know, may not be familiar with, but she, as I understand, is credited with establishing the White House China Collection. But let's talk a little bit more about something else that she did that I think, you know, we, we, we may recall from the earliest days of our presidents, Abigail Adams, um, you know, encouraging her husband to remember the ladies. Well, if I recall correctly, Caroline Harrison really undertook um, an effort to raise money for Johns Hopkins Medical School after they agreed to admit the first women. So, you know, our, our, our most influential, you know, first ladies, you know, almost every one of them, I believe you could probably go back and, and it's probably referenced in your books about, you know, what they did to improve and advance women's rights. Absolutely. Caroline Harrison is also the first 
first lady to be president, and I think the first, first, the first president even of the Daughters of the American Revolution. I, I mean, th- this this stuff goes so. D- and then you go, Lou Hoover is directly uh, uh, related to the 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 Girl Scouts and the first Girl Scout cookie drive. I mean, when you dig into these women, you see, like I say, pop culture, history, women's, and, and, and the, the woman who established or helped establish the children's ward at Johns Hopkins is James Buchanan's niece, Harriet Lane. So, you know, the, the development of one of the nation's greatest medical facilities organizations, researchers, you know, Johns Hopkins is, is what globally, globally, a, 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 an incredible facility. And part of the element of that is their children's ward. And that was established or, or inspired by, or the work began on it from Harriet Lane, who was James Buchanan's niece, who was his official white house hostess. He was the only bachelor president of two James Buchanan and um, Grover Cleveland, who we mentioned, but but uh, James Buchanan never married, and his niece had Harriet Lane had lost basically her entire family through just tragedy over the years, and she became his ward and his his White House hostess. So she established uh, funds and 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 activities which started the National Art Gallery <clears throat> in Washington D.C., which we go to now under the umbrella of the Smithsonian. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the Children's Ward at Johns Hopkins. So then comes along Caroline Harrison, you know, however many years later, um, um, uh, closer, closer to the 1900s than the Civil War, away from when, when, uh, when James Buchanan was, was in office. She comes in and, and is part of the, the first women to go there. Uh, this happens throughout history, also in the White House, with guests at the White House, first African-American guests, first wives of politicians to come to the White House and be entertained. And Caroline Harrison is a part of that in history and then goes on <clears throat> to become the first president of the of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And this is while she was first lady, because Caroline Harrison died in the White House when her husband was president. She's the she's the second first lady to die in office or during her first lady's term. Benjamin Harrison marries someone down the road, but when he's when he's a former president, so he remained a widower throughout the rest of his term until Grover Cleveland gets elected to his second non-consecutive term, the only president. It just, see, it goes and goes and goes, Renee. And when you weave these webs and it goes through, all the tangents and the trains come back into the station. But this, for, for maybe a final plug for the, for the cruise, this is the way I operate. This is the way I talk. So if we're going out dancing or we're going to a show or we're having dinner or walking around the Bahamas, or Duval Street on Key West after the White House tour. It's whatever pops into my head, which relates to a first lady, which inevitably relates to another first lady and a story down the road. And next thing you know, you've got more trivia than you ever thought you'd have and more knowledge about a number of these first ladies who you didn't even know were first ladies when we started the conversation. Well, we want to make sure folks are familiar with their first ladies. Again, you can order your signed copies by going to firstladiesman.com, firstladiesman.com. Of course, they're always available as well uh, on Amazon. You can get them through Barnes & Noble. Uh, Walmart carries them. Uh, Books a Million. And now, exciting, available through iTunes. So what great incentive for people to take nice long walks and learn about our first ladies. Um, Andrew Oak is our guest, First Ladies Man. Find him at firstladiesman.com. Andrew, let's close out our Women's History Month discussion um, open-ended. What else do you want us to know, either what it is that you're working on or who we maybe want to also highlight in this Women's History Month? Well, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing, and, and you had mentioned a volume three, <clears throat> and I said that, you know, I'm always working on that, is the C-SPAN series, which made me the first ladies, man. It was the C-SPAN White House Historical Association, and I can never thank them enough for having the trust and faith in me to bring me on as a series producer to travel to every home, library, church, train station, museum, birthplace, cemetery, you know, every place that I could get to, but I couldn't get to every place. You know, there's only so much time to do what we could do and get these shows on the air because we were we were getting the content as the shows were going live each each week. 90-minute shows on basically every first lady, then Martha Washington through Michelle Obama. My my studies now continue, but they don't just continue with the new women. I've been able to with the new first ladies. I've been able to go back and go to Lucy Webb Hayes' birth home in Chillicothe, Ohio 
where I wasn't able to get during this during the season, just the the show when it was airing and being produced. I was able to go to Greensboro, North Carolina, which is the, basically the birthplace. It was a a, um, a colony back then when when Dolly Madison was born, and see an incredible collection which was purchased from a private owner uh, in Philadelphia with artifacts that I never would have seen and never gotten to during the during the uh, <clears throat> during the show. So I not only collect new information on new first ladies and more information on Michelle Obama every day and more information on Melania Trump every day and more information on Dr. Jill Biden every day and whoever will come after Dr. Jill Biden. I'm going back and filling in some gaps that I didn't even know were there. So there's always so much more to learn about these women, even the women that we think. When I went to Springfield, uh, Illinois to study Mary Lincoln, there were documents and letters there from her son, Robert Todd Lincoln, who, who outlived uh, uh, all of them, the entire family. But there were new documents and letters from his journals which shed light on his relationship with his mother. And it was far better than we thought it to be or far better than hi- history treated it. And so there are new documents, new information, new artifacts that get discovered about these women, all of them, all the time, and that's why it's just a continuous project and program. And that's why when I go to things like the Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival and meet people like Reverend Inman and get on these board of directors and things that meet people of, of all these different families and, and descendants and direct relatives and cousins and sisters, and, and it's just there's always new nuggets and new information, and I'm always taking notes and always writing it down. So when I do eventually add the chapter for Dr. Jill Biden expand the Melania Trump uh, Obama opens his his museum and I get library and I get to go there and get that behind the scenes look like I had with all the others there's so much other information to fill in that way when I put everything together in one volume like a like a not a greatest hits but whatever we do next with the books and how we compile them it's just going to be a different story or an additional story about so many first ladies and that's one of the most amazing things about this whole project well, we're excited for that, and we will continue to track it. Again, to learn more, to maybe even invite uh, the First Ladies Man to your community, I encourage you to visit him at firstladiesman.com, firstladiesman.com. Don't forget there's still space to sign up and join him on that First Ladies Cruise in 2024. Again, you can do that and learn a lot more by going to firstladiesman.com. Andrew, thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us, for helping us celebrate women's History Month, talking about some of the most influential women in America's history. And thank you for writing about them and researching them and continuing to be so enthusiastic to share their stories. We appreciate your time today, as always, and we will have you back again much sooner than the last time. So thank you again. Well, thank you, Renee. And it's people like you that make this project so much fun and get the word out. And and, and I just can't thank you. Endlessly uh, grateful for, for your friendship and your interest in this, in this whole 